are very glad to be here. Um, and I realize that I'm what stands between you and a very good lunch, so I'll make sure I'm on time. <laughs> So yeah, so uh, my name's Nick Hartman. I'm from CKM Advisors. Uh, our main office is in New York City, although we serve clients uh, all around the world. And our major objective as a firm is uh, really to use data analytics to deliver efficiency and performance improvement um, to, to our clients. And those clients are mostly large uh, Fortune 500 firms, although uh, we are increasingly working with some uh, smaller firms as well. And so. Uh, we really have a collaborative relationship with our clients, um, with their budding data science teams that are operating internally or we're helping them start data science teams. Um, and our goal is ultimately to increase the level of data science maturity inside the organizations so that they can continue on a cycle of continuous improvement using their data to drive those things inside their firms. And so how does that process sort of work? Um, so when we arrive uh, in a lot of clients, you know, Typically what they say is they know that they have some opportunities for performance improvement. They know they have a lot of data, but they're not quite sure how they can close that gap, how they can use that data in order to drive performance improvement. And so a lot of times when we arrive inside a client environment, we'll, you know, there'll be what we call this aura of frustration around their processes. And so they'll say, you know, things take too long, our customers aren't happy with certain areas. Um, and they know they have a lot of data. And initially, you know, a lot of the senior managers will say things like, you know, I think, I think we should do some big data. You know, this will, this will help us solve our problems. I, I read an article in the New York Times, big data is really hot, we have a lot of data. That will help us. Uh, and what we really have to do with the clients is say, okay, how do we go from that initial rec recognition that you have data that might be useful to get it down to a level that's actually actionable, that will change what you do on a day in and day out basis in, order, in terms of improving these processes and improving performance. And so, what we do is we work with them to really drill down through their data and we keep moving down through this crust of the aura of frustration. We get down to themes of badness where they can see that things happen in some areas more than others, pockets of inefficiency. And what we're really driving to get down to is specific measurable things that are going wrong that they can fix and that they can measure that they fixed it and see the performance improvement from that. And so when we get down to this most mature level, we can say, you know, we can make measure, measurable improvement if we can digitally track and fix this specific situation. And so when we're working with clients on process mining, that's really the level of action that we're trying to get to. And that's a few of the things that I want to show you as some examples today of where we've worked uh, in terms of getting to that point. So how do we actually do this in practice? Um, we work exclusively inside client firewalls. We never remove any data outside the company. Uh, for the clients that we work with, which are oftentimes large financial institutions uh, or other organizations that have a lot of customer data, uh, that's essentially a, a baseline requirement. They don't want any of their data to leave their data center at all. And so we always set up shop inside their operations. And how do we do that? So we turn up and we take their giant enterprise system where all of the processes ex exist and all that data flows into their giant storage database and we just tap into that and we start doing our analysis and everything's great, right? Well, if only it were so easy, right? The reality is that most large companies, as much as they've tried to have centralized systems, large enterprise management systems to govern their processes, um, it, it almost never exists in that state. Maybe some small sub-process has one nice system that governs it. But if you look across the whole company, and particularly when you're talking about complex processes, uh, it really starts to look something like this. And we deal a lot with um, IT incident management, very similar to the previous talk that we just heard. And when we look where, you know, where is all the data stored for all these different processes? Um, you could have work engagement systems, so things like Remedy or ServiceNow, where there's processes being governed for incident problem and change. You have all sorts of other systems around um, monitoring network components, monitoring configuration items, monitoring software components. Um, you have systems, contextual systems, around the HR data, around who are these users that are actually doing things in the process and what is their role and who do they report to. Um, things like timesheets, when are different people working, when are they on call, when are they not on call, uh, to help explain things like why did it take eight hours for something to happen, oh it turns out that user was actually not at work during this time. Um, financial systems around cost, uh, project tracking systems, a lot of times things like change are connected to other uh, larger initiatives and can we link them 
link things to that. So when we actually look at the bigger process in the organization and where the data exists, it ends up looking, you know, something like a spaghetti plot. And that's really not an exaggeration in terms of where does the data exist for each of these different process points. And so our objective is really, can we help the client get all this data, bring it into one sort of centralized environment where we can then actually do analytics to be able to follow processes and follow uh, the data generated from these processes across all these systems. And again, the goal is to get down to that actionable insight so that they can use it to change what's going on in the organization. So I'm gonna give you two sort of examples of the work that we've done uh, doing that sort of approach. Both of them are around uh, IT um, um, management. First one is around IT help desk, um, somewhat similar to the very first talk in, in terms of uh, people calling up with specific issues related to their experience. Uh, and the second is around IT production management, which is um, more back office type functionality uh, related to production apps inside large organizations, things like financial systems or order management systems, etc. So um, just before I dive into that in terms of the help desk, a very quick overview of, of what the help desk does. And you've heard a little bit about this in, in the first few talks. Uh, at a very high level, um, these organizations are following what's called ITIL which is a framework for how you manage and govern um, IT assets and IT processes. And there's really three big components to that. It's a bit of a simplification, but there's three big components. The first being incidents. This is sort of when something goes wrong. Um, a user gets an error message. Um, a piece of software breaks. A batch file doesn't run properly. And sometimes you have many different incidents that have a similar root cause. So an error message keeps popping up for users. The incident could be helping the user right then and there fix that error message but there could be a, a code problem behind the scenes that's actually causing that to happen on a recurring basis. And so then you want to identify what is that problem, what is that underlying root cause that's actually causing these sort of similar incidents. And ultimately, hopefully, you get to the point where you can implement a change. So maybe you have a developer go in and, and change that code so that now uh, you fix the problem and, and all those incidents also go away. So at a very high level, simplified basis, this is sort of the realm in which a lot of these organizations are operating in. So, at the help desk level, the help desk is very much focused on the first portion of that, on incident. They're getting calls from users, people saying, I'm getting this problem, I'm getting this error message. Their objective is to fix that issue as fast as possible um, to get the customer or get the client back on track. And so, um, as you've heard before, you know, there's a lot of manuals that these groups often operate on in terms of having a very clearly defined process that goes from A to B to C to D in terms of resolving these issues. But of course, as I'm sure you all know, if you use process mining, as we've done, um, and actually follow what is the process for, from the incident coming into it being resolved, uh, it's not very simple at all. However, if you look at what sorts of things system management currently use to track the performance of these processes, to track uh, how well is the organization uh, functioning, they tend to use very high-level metrics. Things like the, the mean time to acknowledge a, a call that comes into the help center, the mean time to close or resolve a call, um, an aging ticket report, so give me a report of tickets that have been open for a long time. Or um, they want to study tickets by precise categories, so trying to figure out is this application A or is this application B. What we always find is that if a human has to choose from a drop-down menu which category it falls into, 10 different humans will pick 10 different categories for the same issue. Um, and so the reality is that this sort of high-level, highly averaged, somewhat pre-sliced metrics um, doesn't really provide uh, a very good insight into the reality of what's going on in the process. And in many ways, um, the management ends up finding that that high-level BI reporting is, is almost like a brick wall in terms of seeing what's actually going on. And so by using process mining, we're really trying to make sure that we can provide that granular level of insight in terms of what's actually going on in these processes. And so if we use process mining on an incident resolution process with a help desk, um, you know, we get something that looks like this. And this was done with Disco. It's drawn, drawn a bit differently here, but it was, uh, the analysis itself was done using Disco. And those of you who've done a lot of process mining may instantly start to recognize a few things that look a bit suspicious, um, where you have divergent paths, where you have things that are looping back. And um, our goal here in terms of the process mining is saying we can identify those things, we can identify loopbacks, we can identify a rework, we can even identify when things take longer um, than, than normal. Um, but our objective, as I mentioned earlier, is how do we bring in other data sources 
to make sure that the management can then get down to the level where they say, aha, I see precisely why that's occurring and what we need to do about it. So one area in this particular case that we wanted to focus in on was down here on the bottom left. And what this situation is, ha what's happening here is sometimes when you call a help desk, and you've probably all experienced this yourself, when you call a help desk, the goal is for that person on the phone with you to resolve the issue right then and there. But sometimes um, they don't have the right training or they don't know, or they don't have the right access privileges or it's a complicated issue and they have to say, oh, we have to escalate this. We have to send you to a level two support. And so um, what we observed in the process mining is that when that process happened, uh, the escalation, the act of me saying, oh, we can't solve this, we'll send this to level two, happens very quickly. It happens on the order of a matter of minutes. But the process for that level two escalation team to actually get back and say, okay, here's what your issue is, we're gonna work and resolve it, can actually take sometimes on the order of days um, for a number of reasons, one of which is that um, help desk support is not the primary function of those level two teams and, and these issues may be lower priority to them. Um, so we observed right off the bat that as soon as you got escalated to a high level queue, you were gonna delay the process potentially by a few days. And there were several other um, sort of insights like that from the process mining. Um, but we wanted to, you know, layer on some of the data sources and see which one of these actually mattered a lot to customers. And so we wanted, we'll focus on this one here um, this morning. So we wanted to use other data to say, do the customers care about this? Is this actually really an issue? Um, sometimes when we do the process mining, we observe things that may be a defect from an optimization standpoint in a perfect world, but it doesn't have a huge impact on, on customer satisfaction or other performance metrics. Um, we wanted to understand why is it happening? Why is it taking so long? Is it, is it even necessary for that to happen? Is it preventable? Can we, is there something we can do about it if it was something the customers weren't happy about? So we layered in a lot of other data um, to study what was happening in those particular cases. And one of the things that we brought in uh, was information related to customer satisfaction. It came from a few sources, one of which is there's methods in the systems for users to express their dissatisfaction. There's surveys, there's buttons people can push to chase tickets. Um, also, sometimes people will call up the help desk a second time and call about basically saying, hey, I called before and my thing still isn't resolved, what's going on? So when we brought all that sort of data in, we found that when the tickets were not escalated uh, into that higher level queue, they were only complained about 2% of the time. But when they were escalated, about 26% of the time, a quarter of the time, people were complaining. So that said to us, okay, well, clearly it seems pretty strong indication that those ones that are being escalated and taking a longer time to come back, um, users you know, seem to be less happy about those tickets. To answer some of the other questions about is this something we could even prevent in the first place, um, we actually looked at text mining. And for those of you who are gonna be in the workshop this afternoon that, I, that I'm gonna be giving, I'll talk a bit more about some text mining techniques. Uh, but we wanted to understand you know, what's actually inside these arrows? When, when a process goes from step A to step B, um, what's happening and why is it happening? And in the systems that we look at, there's often several sources of data along those lines, one of which is um, in the system itself, there's places to put commentary or notes. There's the original description. If you reassign a ticket to somebody, you can say, I'm reassigning this to you to do X, Y, and Z. Also, we, we sometimes try and look at things like email and IM by coordinating the timestamps of the events to the people who, you know, if person A sent it to person B and at a certain time, and we see that they also sent an email uh, a few minutes later, um, we're able to study that, and oftentimes we see that indeed they're sending them details about the process, uh, event logs, etc. So we try and pull that data in and study what is actually happening during this exchange, particularly when it's coming back and when it's taking a long time to come back. And what we saw a lot of in those cases was comments coming back from the higher level queue saying, hey guys, you never needed to escalate this, you should have been able to handle this, um, or they're asking for clarification, you know, this wasn't clear to us, or uh, you know, there was more troubleshooting you should have done before you escalated it. <coughs> so it's giving us some indication that some of this uh, activity, this loopback, uh, could have been preventable. So that was, that was an interesting insight, but we really wanted to get down to the level of saying, okay, well, but how can managers actually use that? So up to this point, um, and, and one of the common things that managers often say about the data science that we do, and it's a very valid point, is saying, well, you, you very clearly define what we're doing wrong, but it doesn't help us do it better. So how do we use the data to take it to that final level and say, here's how you can measure it to the point where you can do it better. And so uh, the last thing that we did in this area was we brought additional information into the process in terms of who are the people that are actually touching these tickets. And 
we wanted to say, you know, is this something that everybody's doing the same, or some people doing this better than others? Uh, and what we found was a distribution of uh, support personnel, and they're just identified by letters here on the bottom, uh, and how often they escalate certain types of tickets. So this is one type of ticket that users commonly call up to the help desk about. And we noticed that at one end of the spectrum, um, person K is escalating over 20% of the tickets that they get about this issue they send to the higher level support queue. And on the other end of the spectrum, others are sending only maybe 5, 6, or 7% of their tickets to the higher level support queue. And on first pass, we could say, okay, but maybe that's just a distribution, maybe, um, you know, maybe person K just gets the harder issues and this person just gets the easier issues. So we wanted to, again, layer that text mining on there and that analysis of the communications back and forth between those process steps to basically say, you know, was it preventable? Should person K really be sending 20% or are they just getting the bad tickets? And what we found is that if you look at the people on this end of the spectrum, they have a pretty low percentage of tickets that get kicked back with those comments that we saw earlier. In this case, this person had about 5% of their tickets sent back. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, this person had almost half of their tickets sent back with comments like, you don't need to send it to us, you should have worked on this more yourself. And so by doing this sort of analysis more and more, we found that for this particular type of issue, um, users should, or the, the help desk personnel should be escalating somewhere around five or seven percent of the tickets um, on average. And that we can study between the text mining and if users are escalating, or the, the support personnel are escalating higher percentages of tickets, this is a red flag to management to say this person maybe needs some more training in this area. Um, this person um, maybe needs to spend some, maybe person K needs to spend more time shadowing person O in order to understand why is it that they can resolve so many more issues than the other person, even though they're getting similar issues. And so at this point, we're starting to identify and saying this is something that management can use. It's a real live KPI that allows them to um, you know, see what's going on, they see a process defect, they see why it's happening, they see when it's happening, who's doing it, and they have actionable input to be able to go actively remediate it, and then also measure the impact of it afterwards, because you can run this analysis afterwards and say, oh, okay, actually, after person K shadowed person O for a while, their level of uh, inappropriate escalations went down quite a bit. And so that's one example of where we're really trying to um, get management to be able to use the data in order to improve their processes in that sense. Um, the second example I want to give you is related to application production support. So this is the um, same support idea around incident problem change, but really around um, uh, applications, sort of business applications, accounting systems that exist within, this, within, a, within a bank, or order management systems that might exist within a, uh, a consumer-facing firm. And within production management, again, they follow this incident problem change mentality, um, but for a variety of reasons, they tend to be extremely focused on the incident side. So if you're in a bank and you have a trading application, you're, you're the owner of a trading application, and that application goes down even for a minute, it can cost the organization millions of dollars. So the processes around identifying when something breaks and fixing it really quickly, at least dealing with the symptom right then and there really quickly, tends to be very well optimized. But where sometimes things um, uh, struggle a bit more, is around the latter portion. So can we identify some more of the deeper root causes of these issues so that they don't keep happening again? And ultimately, this is sort of into the realm of operational risk management. So we can, you know, when the fire breaks out, we put it out very quickly, but what can we be doing to stop the fires from starting in the first place? And so when we study process mining in this area, one of the things we're looking for is not just identifying how efficient the process is going uh, in terms of the incident, where they tend to be quite good in this area, but identifying what information in that process could be better leveraged to say, hey, but we're missing some underlying information here. We're missing some of the risk information that we're not necessarily acting upon. So we have a, we have a phrase for this that we sort of developed, we call, which we call whack-a-mole activity. And let me just explain this thing for a second. I don't know if they have this here in, in the Netherlands, but it, it, if you go into a lot of US arcades, there's a, a game called Whack-A-Mole, where essentially these little moles pop their head up and then you smack them down with a mallet and they pop their head up again and you smack them down. And the game is to keep smacking them down as fast as possible. And sometimes what happens in, in production support organizations is they start getting really good at playing Whack-A-Mole, but they don't necessarily understand why the moles keep popping up. And so if we studied, if we studied from a process standpoint, 
um, this guy's really good. I mean, look, he's, he's smacking the molds down really good. If you look at the IT organization, look, they resolve those incidents really quickly in like a few minutes. And so purely from a process efficiency standpoint, they're doing excellent. But we're trying to ask a deeper question, which is, should you even be running that process in the first place? You know, because the most efficient process is one that you can avoid altogether. And so that's really what we're trying to do in this sort of scenario. And so, you know, the way that we're doing that is we're taking the incoming incident data for different systems and different assets and looking at the process data from that and layering in some additional details, including things like um, the asset details. What is the server? What operating system does it run? What applications does it run? What is the criticality of those applications to the organization? Um, we are also looking at the free text commentary. What's the description of the incident? Who worked on it? What types of comments did they put in terms of the resolution of the incident? Um, we're looking at the process audit log, which is part of the process mining. Um, we're looking at problem data. So when we analyze these incidents, we look into the uh, problem process data and say, did anyone create a problem investigation about this issue? If they did, that's good. But if not, um, you know, maybe that's something that we should be looking at. And also the change data. Have there been any change asset, changes made about this issue or about these assets uh, recently? And we bring that all together into one environment and we use some Python algorithms, Python is a programming language, Python code, in order to uh, basically try and identify where there's repeating processes, repeating incident processes, that actually really represent a problem or a recurring issue that hasn't been detected. And that information, that process information and those incident details get passed off to a team that handles problem investigation, um, and they will then work with the owners of the application and support queues to identify, you know, confirm the results of the analytics. Did we really identify that there's an undetected operational risk here? And then ultimately, hopefully, fix the fix the issue and fix the root cause, which and in the end result means that there's less moles popping up. So um, the support queue sees less uh, incidents to have to resolve in the first place, and so that saves them time and <coughs> saves them money. Uh, but also it means that the application itself can be a lot more stable, which is uh, addressing operational risk. That's something that large institutions, particularly financial institutions, are often very concerned about. And so how do we do that in terms of uh, making it actionable for managers, going back to what we talked about earlier? So we have the process data um, being analyzed by, as I said earlier, a process or a Python algorithm. And we're generating output reports um, that are proactively flagging issues. And so. Essentially what you're seeing here in this case, this is a calendar view on the top, 2013 and 2014. And these red blocks are showing when incidents of a similar type are happening. And that's based on the process data, it's based on the asset data, it's based on text mining that's in there, and trying to identify when it looks like the same sort of thing keeps happening over and over again. And in this particular case, this issue started happening sporadically in 2013, and then earlier this year it happened um, almost every single weekend. And so by identifying what the root cause is, in this case, um, uh, the problem managers were able to find that there was an issue with some conflicting um, services running on the back end of the servers. They were able to address that, uh, and the incident goes away. Um, and so um, now, in, in a sense, we're sort of automating the analytics here and, and being proactive of saying, this is something you should look at. But at the same time, uh, there's, there's the ability to manually investigate all the process data as well, because although we want to try and proactively flag things, we don't want to remove people's ability to uh, proactively look at the process data um, themselves. And so in, in parallel to this, you know, we're also spending a lot of time with the client building out the ability so they can do um, process investigations themselves um, uh, using the data that's available in the system. So we're very excited to hear some of the announcements, that, which I think will actually help um, facilitate that process quite a bit in terms of tapping into near real-time data about the processes. Um, so, and then, you know, once we identify what these issues are, once we identify that there's recurring processes that we could actually consolidate or, or, or uh, mitigate proactively, uh, it allows us to sort of, as you would in real um, petroleum drilling, we can go deeper, we can drill horizontally to get other benefits as well. So we can identify opportunities for automation. So one of the things that we often find is a lot of these processes are related to um, uh, doing recurring maintenance tasks like flushing log files or changing the amount of disk space that a server has. And those are things that can usually be readily automated um, and removing the, the need for a human to, to sort of keep a production system alive. Um, there's a reduction in operational risk, as I mentioned earlier. If you can stop recurring incidents from happening over and over again, um, that's something that 
uh, is very beneficial to the organization from a risk management standpoint. Um, there's improved training opportunities um, in the sense that uh, there needs, there's always needs to be more collaboration between the different silos in an IT support organization. So ideally, the people in the IT support side would say to the people in production support, hey, you had this issue last week and the week before that and the week before that, seems to be something going on here. What we find though is in, in many organizations, these functions are very siloed, sometimes they're even outsourced, and sometimes mm -hmm. that causes a barrier between communication such that they never actually make that phone call. In part because sometimes, depending on how those contracts and organizations were set up, the incident support people are compensated A on how many number how many incidents they resolve and how fast they resolve them. So if they have a bunch of recurring incidents coming in and they can just sit there and play whack-a-mole, every time they whack the mole down, they maybe get a hundred bucks. So are they gonna tell you that they should stop whacking the moles? No. They're just gonna keep doing it as fast as they can and racking up their bill. So um, this you know basically allows you to sort of see that sort of thing and um, you know, maybe change how those groups are monitored and, and et cetera in order to really get everybody to work together to, to achieve a better common goal. And lastly, one of the things that we see is sometimes these recurring issues with the processes are actually not really issues at all, but rather what we would call noise. And so that could be things like false alarms going off in monitoring systems. Um, we detected one case uh, there was incidents being created about an asset that didn't actually even exist anymore, um, but there was um, you know, some, some gaps in terms of a decommissioning process, and so uh, it turned out that if you text mine the, the uh, resolutions for the incidents, what you saw was that the support people just kept saying, it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. The emails were showing that they were emailing people um, saying, can we decommission it? But again, those silos, sometimes people aren't communicating as clearly as they could. This identified an opportunity and you can be able to quell it quite quickly and just take it off the table completely. So that's basically what we're doing. I'm gonna pick up on a few more of these items uh, in terms of data science uh, tools mm -hmm. later this afternoon, but uh, right now, answer any questions if there are any. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, in terms of the data itself, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we never remove anything from the client environment. So that, that gives us a lot more freedom to do things that, um, I mean, we, to put it frankly, we simply couldn't do what we do if we, if we were saying, let's, we're gonna put the data in our own system or we're gonna put it in the Amazon cloud or something like that. So that, that helps a lot. In terms of some of the types of data, um, we work very closely with their uh, compliance teams and, and data security teams um, to, to make sure we stay within whatever the data security classifications are. So things like process data around incidents tend to be fairly low level security classification. There's not too many issues getting a hold of that data. When you're talking about things like email and IM data, um, definitely there can be some issues there in terms of making sure we stay within um, rules and regulations. And often what happens is before we're able to get access to say the email conversations between two support personnel, we work with the compliance people to show the process log data and make a very specific data request. So we say, I wanna know the email sent between person A and person B that was sent plus or minus five minutes of them having interaction in the system. So we're not sending a broad reaching net out to say, um, just show us everybody's conversations. We just want to see specifically where we have very strong evidence that that particular conversation, that particular IM uh, interaction was related to the process. Um, and, and we're able to meet those requirements then usually in most countries, and not every country, but in most countries we're able to, uh, to then get that data to analyze. Any um, I have a question concerning this work and wall mentality, so to say. Um, it seems that it makes sense to start investigating the process a little bit earlier before you come to the incident. So do you have customers who want you to start investigating the development process, the design process, and uh, if yes, uh, what are the sources uh, of the logs for process mining? That's a good question. I think, um, so a lot, of times, a lot of times it can be hard to get that sort of data because there's often that, that, that sort of interaction, the early, early application development is not it should be probably, but it's often not done in a sort of centralized system or, or it's done very differently by different regions. Um, but I think um, 
when we, uh, I, I think what we're seeing is a lot of clients being able to use this sort of data to feed into their future um, development processes, particularly around what types of data to record by applications. Um, we're working with one client where they are redoing their incident management and change management um, uh, system that, that's actually keeping track of these processes. And the, the findings that we're taking from their existing system are directly feeding into what data should they be recording in the new system. And an example there is um, everyone's very interested in knowing how long do people work on certain tasks. And the existing system had some technical challenges that meant that it was very difficult to measure how long people were working on specific tasks. Um, but we were able to help them with the new system to make sure that um, you can more easily check in and check out issues so that we actually know not just when a task was completed, but when a task was started. Um, and that, that's, you know, that sort of direct feedback so that um, we're instituting a culture where the data science teams and the, the data teams are directly collaborating with the application development teams so that um, the data that gets produced um, down the line will ultimately be more useful for, from an analytics standpoint. Uh, in general, over all, you take an average of your projects. Uh, what is the approximate percentage of time you take to understand the client environment that is uh, the initial? Yeah. So, uh, so that you get like a clean wall. Yeah, that's an excellent question. And, and the reality is, and, and it's something that I think the data science community always struggles with, is that I think data scientists tend often to spend um, 80 plus percent of their time doing precisely that, understanding the architecture, getting the data, <coughs> integrating the data, and, and far less than we would like doing analysis. And I think um, some of that is a byproduct of, of what I showed earlier in terms of how fragmented the systems are. Um, some of it is that you know, there's a lot of great technologies for collecting and integrating data, but they're still very new. I think um, there's a lot of great work being done in terms of speeding up that process. Um, inevitably, as well, inside companies, there's also um, uh, cultural issues, uh, political issues, compliance issues, uh, in terms of who controls data uh, and how you get access to the data you need in order to, to do the process mining. And, and I think the benefit of, of the type of work we're doing is that it forces conversations to happen inside companies about who really owns the data. Is it the system owner? Is it the business unit? Or is it at a firm level? And should there be a firm-wide data governance group? And I think we're seeing more clients move towards that, that ladder in terms of saying, look, this data belongs to the firm. It doesn't belong to the, the group that runs that system. Uh, and so we need to make sure that we have a common strategy for how we can leverage that information, um, both to speed up that whole process um, but also to make sure that uh, we're making it, uh, best use of all that information we can. We do have time for another question, so if there's someone else. What kind of, can you say anything about the tool you use to gather the logs from all the fragmented places? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, we use uh, probably about six or seven different techniques uh, in terms of collecting the data. and. Um, uh, I'm going to go into a bit more detail this afternoon, but, but to highlight uh, here, the simplest way is, is if you can connect directly to a database, you just copy it across. But in most cases, you can't do that. We, I think we heard in the very first talk, a lot of systems are set up for security reasons that you're really not allowed to do that. So um, sometimes we would have uh, prepared reports sent, um, either a prepared view that we could query live through, say, like an API, um, or a prepared view that's generated as a flat file and sent across um, once an hour, once a day. Uh, and it would get ingested into our environment. That ingestion um, would typically occur either through, if it's a Windows-based system, something like a C-sharp script that, that reads in the data and writes it to our repository, or increasingly with um, Hadoop environments and things being built up. There's a number of Hadoop tools, um, Hive, uh, um, um, and a few other uh, ingestion tools to, to sort of suck that data in uh, into the Hadoop environment. Um, occasionally, we get things by email attachment, which is which is always very awkward. But there are cases where um, uh, clients will have systems um, that, for whatever reason, you just can't connect to, and so their teams come up with this. They will email an attachment to the service account, so you have a script that reads the email and ingests the attachment, um, uh, and um, and APIs as well. So we use um, typically either as an XML file or a JSON file, being able to pass a query to a system and then get the data back and be able to ingest that. So it's sort of a, a hodgepodge. There's, and, and that's one of the things we have to be very flexible about because it really isn't. Um, and, and usually what we tell the system owners is, you know, here's this, all this suite of things that we could potentially do. Tell us what's easiest for you. 
um, as opposed to saying, you know, we need you to give us this precise way of accessing the data. Um, if we do that, then in some cases, we would probably never get access to the data. Is there one more question? Otherwise, uh, we're just on time. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.